he was mad. By now Wittgenstein was breaking new ground in logic and felt he was close to solving the problems that had prevented Russell from discovering the logical foundation for mathematics. The only trouble was, he now felt sure he would die before he could publish the truth. Wittgenstein wrote to Russell demanding that they meet as soon as possible so that Wittgenstein could tell him where he had gone wrong. Despite this turmoil, when the two vacationers returned to England, Wittgenstein informed Pinsent that this was the best holiday he had ever had. In the understatement of a true Englishman, Pinsent confided to his diary that Wittgenstein had been trying at times, but he had enough sense to promise himself that he would never vacation with him again. Meanwhile, Wittgenstein was having a series of urgent meetings with Russell. Wittgenstein was in an excited state, and Russell found it impossible to follow his complex logical arguments. But Russell became even more exasperated when Wittgenstein refused to commit himself to paper until he had brought his ideas to perfection. In the end, Russell managed to persuade Wittgenstein to let a stenographer be present at their meetings, so that Wittgenstein's answers to Russell's probing questions could be taken down in shorthand. These stenographer's notes form the basis of Wittgenstein's first work, Notes on Logic. In it, he makes numerous insightful remarks, some of breathtaking simplicity, such as, A is the same as the letter A. Russell understood at once what Wittgenstein was trying to establish. In order to overcome the paradoxical difficulties of Russell's classes, things needed to be shown in symbolic form rather than said, because they simply could not be said and were in fact unsayable. This was difficult to grasp at the best of times. Indeed, probably only Russell really understood what Wittgenstein was getting at. And it looked like it would remain that way, for, as Russell said, I told him he ought not simply to state what he thinks true, but to give arguments for it. But he said arguments spoil its beauty, and that he would feel as if he was dirtying a flower with muddy hands. Wittgenstein was a perfectionist. Either you understood perfectly, completely, and at once what he said, or there was no point in listening to what he said at all. Yet in this unpublished work, Wittgenstein did include certain ideas he had about philosophy. These are remarkable for their originality. No one was thinking like this in 1912, and they also contain the conception of philosophy that he was to retain throughout his life. In philosophy, there are no deductions. It is purely descriptive. According to Wittgenstein, philosophy gave no picture of reality and it neither confirmed nor confuted scientific investigation. Philosophy consists of logic and metaphysics. Logic is its basis. It appeared to have little connection with reality, and was more concerned with the study of language. Distrust of grammar is the first requisite for philosophizing. Wittgenstein had identified philosophy with logic. Here in embryo was much of his later philosophy. It could be said that from now on he devoted his life to elaborating these remarks and their implications. But before embarking upon his new philosophy, Wittgenstein decided that perhaps it was time he studied this intriguing subject. There was no harm in finding out what others had been up to. According to Pinsent, Wittgenstein has only just started systematic reading in philosophy, and he expresses the most naive surprise that all the philosophers he once worshipped in ignorance are after all stupid and dishonest, and make disgusting mistakes. So much for the opposition. Wittgenstein now decided to return to Norway and live in isolation for the next two years, doing logic. Even by Wittgenstein's standards this was somewhat drastic. According to Ray Monk's superb biography of Wittgenstein, Russell thought this idea wild and lunatic. He tried his best to dissuade Wittgenstein, I said it would be dark, and he said he hated daylight. I said it would be lonely, and he said he prostituted his mind talking to intelligent people. I said he was mad, and he said God preserve him from sanity. God certainly will. Pinsent was deeply saddened at their farewell, although neither of them had the slightest inkling this was to be their final parting. Even Wittgenstein seems to have been peripherally perplexed by his decision, but was nonetheless determined to go through with it. 
Wittgenstein duly sailed to Norway and soon found just the place he was looking for. This was a hut, ninety miles up the Hardanger fjord, which could be reached only by rowboat from the remote village of Schulden. It is difficult to conceive of any place in Europe farther removed from the sophisticated splendours in which he had been brought up. And this was probably the point. Wittgenstein now embarked upon a long, cold, dark winter of utter solitude, doing logic. Not surprisingly, he was soon writing to Russell, I often think I'm going mad. But his letters to Russell also contained evidence of the startling advances he was making in logic. These followed directly from Russell's attempt to discover a logical foundation for mathematics, but went even further, attempting to discover a foundation for logic itself. Wittgenstein asserted that a logical proposition could be shown to be true or false regardless of its constituent parts. For instance, if we say, this apple is red or not red, this is a tautology, i.e., it is always true, and it will always be true regardless of whether the apple is red or not. Likewise, if we say, this apple is neither red nor not red, this is a contradiction, i.e., it will always be false. If we had a method for finding out whether a logical proposition is a tautology or a contradiction or neither, we would have a rule for determining the truth of all propositions. This rule, stated as a proposition, would be the basis of all logic. Wittgenstein would never have returned to civilization for anything so trivial as to protect his sanity, but when he learned that his mother was ailing, he felt obliged to travel to Vienna. On his arrival he found that he had inherited a fortune, but he preferred that his life not be encumbered with Wittgenstein money, so he decided to give it away. He started by making donations, anonymously, to a number of Austrian poets. His choice of recipients was revealing. One was Rilke, whose cultivated lyrics expressed an intense spirituality. Another was Trakul, who hymned his obsession with guilt and decline in a series of dark, enigmatic images. At the outbreak of World War I, Wittgenstein volunteered for the Austro-Hungarian army. His friend, Pinsent, enlisted with the British army and thus was on the opposing side. Wittgenstein volunteered not because he particularly believed in the cause of the German powers, but because he felt it was his duty. As a Wittgenstein, he could easily have become an officer, but he chose to remain in the ranks, an extremely dangerous decision. This was the farcically inefficient army of Hasek's good soldier Schweik, the army whose eastern commander was to dispatch the immortal telegram, The situation is hopeless, but not desperate. Wittgenstein was sent to fight against the Russians on the Eastern Front, where the carnage matched that of the trenches on the Western Front in France. He served on a river gunboat in Galicia, then with an artillery battery. Throughout his service, Wittgenstein continued to write down his philosophical ideas in notebooks. He was doing original philosophy, but he also remained constantly on the brink of suicide. Despite these distractions, Wittgenstein was an utterly fearless soldier, and his exemplary bravery won him two medals. Among the soldiering philosophers, his only rival was Socrates. Wittgenstein was a parody of the driven personality. Characteristically, he saw no reason to try to alleviate this condition by searching for its cause in his own psychological makeup. On the contrary, if only everyone were true to his nature, he thought, everyone could be like this. Wittgenstein rationalized his condition to himself by claiming that life was an intellectual problem and a moral duty. The intellectual and moral aspects of his personality had so far remained two distinct entities, each spurring the other on. It was only during the war that they fused. Under constant intellectual pressure from himself, and the persistent threat of death from both the enemy and himself, Wittgenstein once again found himself in familiar territory, on the brink of insanity. One day, during a lull in the fighting in Galicia, he came across a bookshop. Here he found Tolstoy's Gospels in Brief, which he bought for the simple reason that there was no other book in the shop. Wittgenstein had been against Christianity. He associated it with Vienna, his family, lack of a logical foundation, 
meek and mild behaviour, and other anathemas. But reading through Tolstoy's book was to bring the light of religion into Wittgenstein's life. Within days he had become a convinced Christian, though his conversion had a distinctly Wittgensteinian tenor. With typical rigour he set about integrating his beliefs into his intellectual life. Religious remarks now began appearing in the pages of his notebooks, alongside those on logic, and it soon becomes clear that these two topics have more than intellectual rigour in common. The spirit of one informs the other in compelling fashion. Even Wittgenstein's religion had to assume a logical force and clarity. I know that this world exists, that I am placed in it like an eye in its visual field. There was something problematic about the world, and this we called its meaning. But this meaning did not lie within the world, it lay outside it. The meaning of life, i.e., the meaning of the world, we can call God. According to Wittgenstein, to pray was to think about the meaning of life, which meant that he had been praying all his life, even when he didn't believe there was a God or a meaning to life. Wittgenstein couldn't bear to be wrong ever. Wittgenstein then passed on to the question of the will, an overriding element in his life, if not in his philosophy. He opens with the uncontroversial assertion that he knows his will penetrates the world. He then passes on to claim that he knows my will is good or evil, therefore good and evil are somehow connected with the meaning of the world. But how does Wittgenstein know that his will is good or evil? And what precisely does he mean by these two terms? Also, if his will is within the world, and the meaning of the world lies outside it, it is difficult to see how they can be somehow connected. Once again Wittgenstein seemed to consider that argument only spoiled the beauty of his striking assertions. Russell had tried to correct this bad philosophic habit, but by now he was locked away in a British prison for demonstrating against the war. Wittgenstein was to persist in this infuriating practice which flawed his early philosophical work. But was it a drawback? Wittgenstein appeared to have an inkling of what he was up to, making such striking assertions but leaving them devoid of blurring justification or argument gave what he said an almost oracular force. Could Wittgenstein have been more concerned with effect than with truth? He would have been horrified by such a suggestion, yet there's no denying this thin but distinct thread of what looks suspiciously like showmanship which runs through his life and work. Like it or not, his was a personality of mythical proportions, and for the most part he genuinely disliked this. One can only assume that his attraction to the limelight was at least partly subconscious. In 1918 Wittgenstein was promoted to officer, and transferred to the Italian front. Somehow he had managed to correspond intermittently with his friend David Pinsent throughout the war, but he now received news that Pinsent had been killed. "'I want to tell you how much he loved you up to the last,' wrote Pinsent's mother, oblivious to the irony of her remark. All the evidence indicates that Pinsent remained unaware of the true nature of Wittgenstein's feelings for him. Wittgenstein wrote back to her that David was— my first and my only friend. He was to dedicate his first great work to David Pinson's memory. In 1918, the Austro-Hungarian war effort came to an end in ignoble surrender. In Italy, many of the Austrian officers simply boarded a train back to Austria, abandoning their men to their fate. But not Lieutenant Wittgenstein, who would have been incapable of such an act. It is almost impossible to exaggerate how much Wittgenstein's life was driven by principle. His moments of greatest despair always came when he temporarily relaxed, and was able to see how far below his impossibly high principles his life was falling. When Wittgenstein was taken prisoner by the Italians, he had in his rucksack the only manuscript of the philosophical work he had been writing throughout the war. This was eventually to be called Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus, and is the first great philosophical work of the modern era. Right from its opening sentences, it becomes obvious that philosophy has entered a new stage. 1. The world is all that is the case. 1.1. 1. 1. 
The world is the totality of facts, not of things. One clear, ringing assertion follows another, linked by the absolute minimum of justification or argument. 1.13. The facts in logical space are the world. 1.2. The world divides into facts. The book's conclusion is even more memorable. 7. What we cannot speak about, we must pass over in silence. Few others have altered the course of philosophy in quite so striking a fashion. Such succinct perspicacity is surpassed only by Socrates, Know Thyself, Descartes, I Think Therefore I Am, and Nietzsche, God is Dead. In those parts where it is not too technical, in the logical sense, Wittgenstein's Tractatus is the most exciting work of philosophy ever written. Its clarity and daring leaps of argument make it at times almost poetic, as do many of its conclusions, and its basic idea is simple to grasp. The Tractatus is an attempt to delineate what we can talk about in a meaningful manner. This leads to the question, what is language? Wittgenstein claims that language gives us a picture of the world. This idea had been inspired by a newspaper report he had read about a court case in which model cars had been used to represent an accident. The model cars were like language describing the actual state of affairs. They pictured what had happened, but most important, they shared the same logical form. They both obeyed the rules of logic. The model cars, language, could also be used to describe all possibilities, near-miss, traffic jam, absence of car that was alleged to have caused the accident, and so forth, but they could not describe two cars occupying the same space at once, or one car occupying two separate spaces at once. Logical form prevented this, both in reality and in language.' 